appreciate you taking time out. We have some really wonderful guests here from the University of Arizona. So you guys know all about the Francis and Fallon Institute. Um, so we're happy to be here and uh, working with the Terminal Speaker Series. So just a couple of friendly reminders. And I know I've said this before, but we are actively putting things on Facebook. And so if you haven't already liked our page, make sure you like it so you can see our regular updates also on Twitter. And my understanding is if you like our page and then we post a picture of you, then we can tag you. And then all your other friends and your colleagues can also <coughs> see it too. So make sure you try to do that. We're also doing regular updates of the website. So whenever you have a chance, go in and check that, especially if you have a research lab or personal information on there, make sure that we're updated as much as we can. Uh, we're very thankful for Pamela Turbeville <coughs> and her endowment to Family and Consumer Sciences to support the research and teaching of faculty here and to support in particular the speaker series. So um, thank Pamela next time you see her on campus because she's supporting the snacks and supporting the speakers and all that kind of organization. Um, and you guys remember that she uh, received the Cal's Alumni Achievement Award in 2001. And so today, uh, we have Kimberly Davis, who is the manager of social media at the University of Arizona. Just to give you a little bit of her background, she has a degree in journalism from the University of New Mexico. And she also has an MFA in filmmaking from the University of North Texas. So perhaps not surprisingly, she integrates things like photography and video along with social media. So she has some great ideas to share with you today and get ready to ask questions too. We'll have time for that. Um, and also here is her email in case you want to follow up with her in the future about any other specific questions you have. We are also very lucky to have Doug Carroll. Is that right, Carroll? Yes. yes. Uh, with us today is the Director of Media Relations at the University of Arizona. And so he had uh, worked with the Arizona Republic as a reporter and an editor for 18 years. And now um, he is uh, the person in charge of the U of A Now and U of A News. So those are the kind of things you guys you know, regularly see on the website. Um, and, and so many really great articles to increase the profile. Um, and there's his email in case you want to contact him. I have cards too. Okay. So I'm going to go turn it over to Kimberly first. Does anyone have a guess? Does anyone want to think what, what do you guys think will be the best? 
social media platforms to kind of put yourself out there as a professional or expertise in your field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other? Oh, you guys are so good, because that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are doing good. Um, so I'm going to say Twitter and LinkedIn, um, which ironically kind of have some fears, like, to, like people are, are kind of hesitant about these. So, uh, show of hands, who is on Twitter and LinkedIn? Okay. Out of those people who, like, would say that they're really active on those things? Let's keep some hands on down. Um, so, <laughs> hopefully this will... Uh, I'm going to go over some specific things about Twitter and LinkedIn that some people are a little like, scared of, and hopefully we can alleviate some of those fears today. Um, cool. Well, nobody said Facebook, but I have a slide. So why not Facebook? Um, you know, Facebook is the largest social network in the world, and it seems like a good place to start, right? But when you think about your personal Facebook page, and what you kind of content you share on there and who you're connected with. You're probably friends with your parents, your siblings, like your high school friends. Um, it's, it's kind of an intimate place. Uh, you share personal things about you. You share your wedding photos. If you have children, you can just share pictures of your children on there. It's kind of weird to add strangers on Facebook, right? It's not something that's like cool to do. Just add a, maybe when it first started, but not anymore. So. <laughs> kind of weird there. Uh, and then they, you have the opportunity to have a Facebook page like um, this, this Norton College does and the University of Arizona does, but is it right for you as a professional in your field? The answer is probably not. <laughs> um, you got to ask yourself, is your audience here? Uh, Facebook as a whole is considered an un uneducated audience just because the audience is so broad, not that everyone on Facebook is uneducated, but as a whole, it's kind of simpler things, kind of like news, you know, you want to go at the eighth grade reading level, that's kind of the same notion that you want to take when you're posting on Facebook. Um, so things that are shareable of quick and simple concepts tend to do the best in terms of concepts, so if you have complicated research, it's kind of hard to unless you can make it into a really simple, shareable form, then it's kind of hard to make those connections there. Um, and we must be honest with ourselves, are we famous enough to kind of have a celebrity page? And some of you may in this room, maybe, that might be the truth, and more power to you. Most of us are not. Um, I actually have I actually have a Facebook fan page from when I was a filmmaker, and I like have 175 likes. So that's, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, making it off of my Facebook. So, uh, kind of be honest with yourself, and there's nothing wrong with having it there, but it's probably not going to be where you're going to gain your most traction. So, does anybody have any questions about Facebook? No? Okay. None of you guys said, oh, Facebook, so you guys are there. Okay. So why Twitter? Much like Facebook, if we think about who we connect with on Twitter, it's kind of a more informal connection. Um, it's not weird to add a stranger to Twitter. It's not weird to follow a stranger on Twitter. And think of it more as acquaintances. And it's okay to network on Twitter and make new connections, whether you're personally or professionally. That's totally acceptable. Um, some people that are maybe new to Twitter might feel weird. Like if strangers follow them, it's kind of the way of the world on that platform. Um, another thing that often comes up, and a lot of people ask me, oh, should I have two accounts? Like, do I want to have my personal Twitter? And do I want to have my professional Twitter? Uh, by and large, the answer I want to give is no. Because, I mean, we're all people. And even if we're professional people, we still have human aspects. Social media is for people. and not kind of like robots or brands. Um, so especially in this day and age, being human and being balanced is really engaging. And people like to see that kind of, kind of dare I say, kind of the flaw of humanity and that we are, we are people. We have opinions. And we have interests, and um, that's people like that. Especially if you're a professional that's kind of leading conversations in your field, they like to find aspects of your life that they can relate to. So if you're willing to open yourself up to that, uh, Twitter's a good place for you. Okay. So the first thing that people tend to get confused with on Twitter, all those are complicated, are hashtags. So when you're talking about specific topics or events. It's good to kind of do some research and find out what 
hashtags are popular. So say there's like a national conference that you're attending, it'll probably say right on the program. It's a good idea just maybe to click on that hashtag, you can look and see kind of what conversations are going on there. That's a great way to connect with people at the conference, um, especially especially now in these days. That's kind of a good way if it's a large conference where you can make some connections and you start conversations with people and then you can, that conference can take them offline, like, oh, let's have lunch and discuss this further. Um, in the same aspect, you know, if there's kind of an ongoing conversation about something in the news in your field, uh, you can kind of keep track of the conversation that way. Um, you can use the search function, which I'm going to show you in a second, to kind of narrow down hashtags to location specific <laughs> and also uh, the types of media, whether they be photos, videos, uh, etc. Um, and a word of advice is if you want to create your own hashtag for say your own event or something going on, you want to make sure that you research it before adopting. Um, who else is using that hashtag? Um, Ford here I used to work at the University of Houston and our baseball team was going into the like NCAA tournament and they were, I don't know why, they were using M, like hashtag M32. <coughs> when they got to M16, I kind of had an issue with them because if you click on the hashtag F16 and there was like a bunch of photos of guns and then our baseball team. And I was like, is this really appropriate? And um, if you're not sure, I suggest, I'm not going to talk too much about Instagram today, but look on Instagram too if you're confused about what people are talking about. Then you can usually see what they're talking about. So if you if you, people are using that hashtag and you're not really sure what that conversation is about, uh, check out Instagram. You'll probably get a visual of, of whatever uh, is going on there. And uh, six months is kind of fair game. So if someone was using your tag, or you have the same tag as a previous conference, and it's been six months, um, that's usually considered acceptable fair game. If it was like you know yesterday, then you might want to consider having a different hashtag just so you don't overlap. It's kind of common courtesy. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how to look more on hashtags. Okay. So, let's see, so when you're on your Twitter, this is my personal Twitter page, because I can't remember off the top of my head what the university's uh, <laughs> password is, but if you, when you log on to your Twitter, and this is your kind of homepage, and kind of feed of the people that you follow, um, if you go over here, there's actually trending hashtags of what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to think of which one would be appropriate to look at. Let's do one. <laughs> When traveling, I prefer. So when I click on that, um, it's gonna ca it's gonna narrow down all the tweets that people have used that tag. That's kind of what the hashtag is. It's an organizational function. And so when you tag something, your tweet will be kind of compartmentalized into uh, a stream of tweets that are also talking about using that same tag. So if you're talking about a subject, it's beneficial to use a tag rather than not. So <coughs> maybe people who are interested in when traveling, I prefer then they will see your tweet more likely to hit more with your audience. So um, you're usually brought to this top, which is kind of, you navigate over here, and then it'll show you photos and kind of like, usually uh, that blue, this blue mark here, that means a verified <laughs> account. So <laughs> I take no responsibility for the tweets that are on Twitter right now. Um, so usually people have a little bit more clout and are popular. Um, that's what will be showing on here. And then if you want to see everything that's going on in some people that may not be as popular, oh wow, stay with swamps. Um, <laughs> this is kind of everybody if you go to the live and it's gonna you're gonna see more often. So especially when you're researching a hashtag, I would go to the live section up top here. And that way if you know people who are not really getting much attention or engagement on their tweets and they're still thinking of using that tag, then you can see that. Um, if there's a specific account that's associated, if there's not with here, uh, if we did Dear Shock Top instead, and we let right here, I guarantee the Shock Top, <coughs> to the promoted tweet, um, would be the account associated with that. Um, you can look at photos, uh, videos, and then here is where you can kind of start narrowing down. Um, you can look at photo or tweets that are near you. <laughs> Apparently, nobody in Tucson is participating in this conversation. Um, and you don't necessarily have to do Tucson. You can go here to the advanced search. And uh, you could add a specific location uh, if you 
wanted to just if we wanted to broaden it out to Arizona and we wanted to you know have specific words or it's you can get pretty detailed in this when you're searching. And the great thing about this is well, maybe you can't save it anymore. You used to be able to save it. Uh, but maybe not anymore. <laughs> but uh, you can really be more if you're looking for conversations <laughs> about your specific topic, you can get the detail on there. Okay. So the next thing we're talking about is mentions. same story, this is actually a UA News story in them, and one of them is using the mention of the University of Arizona at U of A correctly, and one of them is not. So, who thinks the top one is correct? Who thinks the bottom one's correct? Nobody's correct. <laughs> you guys don't know? Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, these are the same exact story. The bottom one is actually correct. And the reason why is if you start a tweet out with the at sign, like this KZ, KJZZ morning edition, which they should know better, um, <laughs> you're actually sending a reply. So the only people who saw this tweet are people that follow us in KJZZ morning <laughs> edition. And so you're really limiting your audience when you start that. So what, you might see this a lot on Twitter when people use a period in front. So Arizona Science Desk, when they sent out this tweet, it went to every single one of their followers had the opportunity to see this. So that's a good tip to keep in mind, um, and it, especially when you're starting off and you might start mentioning institutions or partners that you're working with. Um, it's really easy to accidentally start off your tweet with an app. <laughs> and so take anything away from today. You'll know not to start your tweet out. But it's okay. Like if, you're, if they were just replying to something we said, then that would be fine. Um, but they're, we're sharing one of our stories, and the only people that saw it were probably us. <laughs> okay. So another key function on Twitter is our lists, and uh, this kind of allows you to segment, segment your audience. So if you have, you're following certain people who have an interest here, you can put them on a list or. Or if you want to just have publications that maybe um, are specific to your interests, um, you can put them on a list. And yeah, it really kind of streamlines your conversation. You can actually subscribe to other people's lists. So I guess I'll show you my list. I don't have anything too embarrassing. <laughs> I did not look at that part of the morning. Okay. So. Uh, so I kind of, people that do social media in Arizona, I kind of need to pull that out. People who tweet uh, for Pac-12 accounts have a list. I have higher end social media people on a list. I have Tucson, and we can actually go ahead and look at one of the tweet. <laughs> That's like a, I'm saying like peeps, but I mean like more peeps, like oh. about peeps, about peeps. Um, um, so this is a pretty, uh, large list I have, and it's, it's people that kind of do the same thing as me, or they might be for a specific college, but they do social media for higher education. And so when you go to your list, it'll, so everyone that I flag to be on this list, um, their tweets show up. You could actually see who's on it, so I can keep track of who's on it. So these are all the people that I have on that list. Um, people can subscribe to it, so these uh, oh look, Melissa Vito's tracked to my list. <laughs> so people can subscribe to the list. Um, you can also, people can add you to lists. Uh, and you can make lists private, so if, if you make a public list, people are going to know that. So if you put, like, people I totally hate and disagree with, um, <laughs> and you don't make it private, then they'll know. <laughs> um, I do have, like, I have, like, my favorite people on a list, and I have it here. And it has that lockbox next to it, so they don't know I, they're my favorite people, but it's just like a personal list that I have. Um, I subscribe to these lists that other people make, and those will show up kind of underneath the list that you made. And you can also see what list people add you to if you go to the member of. So people have added me to these lists, and I can kind of follow and see what lists I'm part of. Apparently, I 
Instagram and a lot of lists. <laughs> but um, it's just, I, you know, I follow almost 5,000 people, so when I go to my home screen, it's really hard, and there's, you know, there's a lot of tweets going on. I follow a lot of businesses. I follow a lot of social media professionals. I'm a huge number of Broncos fan, which is the Super Bowl. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of Broncos people. So, <laughs> as you can see, because I'm right there, um, it's, it's a great way for if I want to, you know, sit down and uh, if I want to sit down and talk to people who have social media in the Pac-12, I can kind of see what they're talking about and these sorts of things and engage in those conversations. So, to create a list, you just List, That's a good question. Um, let's see. Let's see, I'll do it from your home screen. So what you do is you click on your little face here, oh. and you go to your list, and then maybe you can add a list from here. Hmm. I think it's if you actually if you go to somebody, and you you could start a list. So oh. so I have this guy here. And if I click on this little gear, <coughs> more user actions, yeah. add or remove from list, you could actually create a list from the screen. Mm. So I already have him. He's from Tucson, but say if I wanted to like make a new list, like men named Bill, <laughs> I can write a description from that. We're not going to let him know that I made that list. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> that automatically leave me include, but, like that list was created. I Click that there, and then you can, um, you know, you can have okay. multiple lists like I have for this guy here. Thank you. Uh huh. Cool. Back to this. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So moving on to LinkedIn. So much like Twitter, this place is more. For acquaintances, like it's not weird to add strangers to LinkedIn. Some people are a little weird about it, like iffy about it. Like they may not, if, if they've never met you, they might not add you. I add, if they seem like they're kind of like spammers, I might not add them. But if they seem like a legit person who's interested in maybe networking with me in the future, you can usually tell by their profile and how much information they have on there. If it's some like person that's going to try to sell you some software that doesn't exist or some conference that doesn't exist. So be wary of those, but they are out there, but uh, usually I try to connect with everyone. Uh, and the, LinkedIn is, is kind of where you have your more educated audience, and the reason why I say that, the majority of people on LinkedIn have graduated from college, um, and you know they're in the workforce, they're professionals, that's why they have a LinkedIn account. But LinkedIn um, is not, when it first started out, it was a great way to kind of put your resume out there and find jobs, but it's so much more than that. Like, you know, I have to log into LinkedIn every day and I'm not like on job funds or anything like that because people are sharing content that's relevant to my industry, about business, about the workplace, about social media. It really depends on who you follow. So if you're like a construction manager and you follow other construction managers, there may be people who are publishing articles on LinkedIn about construction or starting conversations. <coughs> um, I have groups in LinkedIn. This is you know, there's Facebook groups, but that's a little personal. If you, like, I have a group for people who have my job who are the main social accounts for Pac-12 schools. There's 12 of us. We're all in this LinkedIn group. We have conversations about things that are going on. Um, there's also a higher ed social media one. We actually have one for social media managers at the University of Arizona. Um, groups are really great for that. Um, so it's not weird to reach out. Um, and there's an opportunity to kind of have a public persona on here with publishing. Uh, the publishing is actually just like a platform where you can <coughs> create articles. It's really easy. And um, if you publish enough, you kind of have the opportunity to be an influencer um, if you and have your content show to more people. It's kind of featured on you know the top of the list on the LinkedIn homepage. And um, LinkedIn is all about the network. So you'll want to connect with people, follow those who you respect and that you're interested in. Um, you can't really segment your audience as much as you can with Twitter, so if you don't really like them, you should <laughs> ignore that uh, invitation that they send you. Um, and as a publishing platform, it's, it's a great opportunity to do some cross-platform promotion. Say you have a blog or a website, you can kind of repurpose that content on a LinkedIn, um, and it usually gets pretty well. I've had some, I publish on LinkedIn and I get some good hits off of it. Um, 
and uh, if you publish, it kind of sends like a weekly digest. I don't know how many people read their thousands of LinkedIn emails, but it sends like a weekly digest of people in your network that have published articles that are kind of popular. So you might show up in your um, network's email feed. And uh, if you don't have a, a blog yet or a website and you still want to put content out here, it's it's kind of it's still a platform where you can link back to. Say you want to put this in. You write an article and you still want to link back to it on Twitter, um, you can link back from LinkedIn so you kind of have a place to put your content. And it's a great place, especially if you don't have a blog, you don't have to do that, you can still do uh, LinkedIn articles. So, I'm going to show you a link, the anatomy of a LinkedIn profile. Settings up. Okay. So, when you log on to LinkedIn, you're taken to this page. And it kind of shows you like who's viewing your profile, who's viewing your posts. I share a lot of content on LinkedIn. You don't necessarily have to publish original content. You can share like articles, you can feel them, that sort of thing on LinkedIn. Kind of like what this person's going on. So you're taking to this whole page that's so kind of like a, it's similar to the feed in your Facebook, but it's generally, you know, more, hey, look, it's the ASU social media manager. Um, <laughs> professional stuff going on there. <laughs> um, and if we, I'll show you kind of more how your profile is laid out. Um, so when you have your LinkedIn profile, this first top bar kind of introduces quickly who you are, where you had your education, maybe past places that you've worked. Um, and if you publish, like I have, I have kind of my last three articles in this bar here. Um, and then it kind of goes into your background. I have a summary that I've written out so people can do that. You can actually put projects. These are films that I've made and then uh, my social media blog, um, you can actually pin those websites and so if I click on one of these it goes to like the Vimeo of, of that movie that I made and you can put those up on your summary so it even shows before your experience. Um, same thing with your individual experience, um, you can actually, I have articles that I've been mentioned in or featured in, you can actually tag those so if you're mentioned in an article, um, Doug's, Doug's up next but say you're featured in you know, the Wall Street Journal for your expertise on a certain topic, um, you can definitely include that on your LinkedIn profile and put the link on there. Like I have these, and then I have more articles from the University of Houston. Um, scrolling on down here. If you want some sort of award, you can add your awards and honors on here. Um, your education. Um, and another cool thing that you can add on here is your projects. Um, so, I have some of the films I've worked on, and you can actually tag other people. So I was a cinematographer for this documentary film called Pots and Silence. Um, I can tag um, the director on there if you're connected with them on LinkedIn. So you just kind of more across connection there. Um, I have pretty much everything filled out on my LinkedIn profile. So it, it, the more you fill out on your LinkedIn profile, the more kind of you can engage with people and connect with you. Like if you don't want to be kind of closed off, I recommend trying to fill it out as much as you can, and it'll tell you, oops, I don't have it up there, maybe, it, it has like this like round thing, it says, you're a superstar, fill out more, uh, LinkedIn will tell you, tell you how much you should fill out, you can put volunteer experiences on there, I need to update that because I do not live in Houston anymore, um, and then of course your skills that, that you, people endorse you for, etc., etc., and then if you look, if, going back up here, it's kind of, if you look at your own profile, so what I did is I clicked on profile and then I'll redo it just so you can see. You, it actually takes you to this thing where you can edit it, but if you click view profile as, it kind of goes to what your profile looks like. And you can see uh, people also view, so if people were searching for me and they may have landed on these people. This is my boss now, this is my former boss at the University of Houston. So you can kind of see people that you may be similar with and seeing who else, like people are viewing two different people. It's kind of, you can make connections there. And it also point out who's similar to you um, on this bar. You can scroll through and see um, who's, who's kind of has similar interest in a profile as you. And in terms of publishing, um, if you go to your profile and then your updates, um, it'll show you several different things. So these are actually articles that I have not written, but I have shared. And it kind of shows the activity on them. Because people 
people comment, like, and share those also. Um, you also have, you can view, these are articles that I have published, so I can see how many people have liked them. I can go through and view the statistics. And it'll show you this graph of how many views, and it'll show you um, the industries of people that have been looking at your content, the job titles, all this good information. So you can kind of see kind of the audience that you're building. And it also show you like who's commenting on your posts, um, see who shared it, who's commented on it, who's liked it. Um, so you can, you can have access to kind of see how your content is doing on LinkedIn. And this is 100% free. And, and the great thing about LinkedIn is you don't really have to build, like if you build your own blog, you have to get the website out there to get people to like your blog. But if you're connecting with people on LinkedIn, they're kind of already in that space. Um, you can see how you're, you rank in terms of profile views. You can see who's viewed your profile. Um, another cool thing is that people can follow you. It's kind of like a second level. So I have connections that people connect with me, and then people can actually follow me. And that, basically what that means is that they're interested in the content that I'm publishing. So they don't necessarily have to make a connection with me and be my LinkedIn friend, but they can still follow and see when I post a new article, um, it, they'll be updated. And it shows you kind of like where they are in their career. I have a lot of <coughs> senior people <laughs> follow me. Um, different industries, and you can kind of, if you scroll over these, it'll show you kind of who's looking, marketing and advertising, that's kind of my field, and like where they're at. Um, a lot of people in Houston, Tucson's up there, I live there, I used to live in Houston. Um, so it's pretty cool, and you can, you can of course see who your followers are, who's kind of interested in your content. Does anyone have questions about like the LinkedIn profile and publishing? Yes? I'm confused about what your goal is and how do you measure whether you're successfully doing that, justifying the time you spend on mm -hmm. managing this? Um, well, for me, my goal is to kind of um, put some information out there about social media. Um, so I'm pretty savvy with Snapchat, and I'm one of the few people in higher ed that's pretty savvy with Snapchat. So a lot of people ask me, you know, reach out to me and ask for information for Snapchat. So I wrote this article that's kind of like my five top tips. And so when people connect with me and want information from me, I usually point them to this article that I've already written. And I've also connected with some more people that maybe are using the Snapchat application in their work and making those connections. So it's kind of a way to get yourself out there. So if you're doing kind of um, publications and research about a certain topic, um, it's a, just kind of another platform where you can share your ideas and your content. <coughs> Any more questions on LinkedIn? I would say I've also used LinkedIn to post uh, job openings. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, I get a lot of people who want to connect with me who are former students. And then they, it's been a great way through LinkedIn to stay connected with them because then it has their resume and everything up as well. Um, right. And so they can keep me updated. Or on LinkedIn, they also post if you get a job. Um, things like that, so it's much more specific to your professional activities. So then, when they, you know, or if they come to me to ask for a letter of rec, then I, you know, I've kind of been keeping up, and I know what new things they've done, and um, so it's been good for me for that. I haven't posted as much about my research on LinkedIn. I've done a little bit here and there, mm -hmm. and a little bit like you know awards and stuff. It's a good way to let people know about. That and people have been receptive in that way. But, yeah. I don't know. And you bring up a good point about networking. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to network um, within your alma mater, too. So, if you, like, we, I run the University of Arizona's uh, publication page, um, but I can, I'll show you on New Mexico just so you can see kind of what students um, are able to access through these as an education page. So when I go to an education page, you can kind of see the different areas where people work. And it, I'm not showing the University of Arizona because I'm an admin and it looks way different. <laughs> and you can actually um, look and see like notable alumni. And kind of, you have an opportunity to either follow them or connect with them. So say if I'm really interested in this software, and I know that he's a new, uh, also went to the same school as me, I can follow him and that sort of thing. And that's kind of the thing that you, uh, you kind of
I want to achieve is have more people follow you and that sort of thing. And then you can, you can actually narrow down and search for specific people that graduated in certain times and that sort of thing. So as an alum of a certain of an institution, which you can do this I think if you're a student here when you add the University of Arizona on your education page, <coughs> you can do the same thing and kind of network with people that either have graduated from here and that's a great opportunity to. I would say too with Twitter, I'm getting a little better at like putting some of my research info on Twitter or linking it back. Yeah, you know, like being a little something so you can't put everything on a Twitter <coughs> short, but linking it back so then they come back to the website or they go back to my research gate or they find it another way. And then the people on Twitter are a lot of other professors. Um, so then I hear about what they're doing. And Twitter is really interesting too because there's a lot about, so I, on Twitter I follow like Department of Education and National Institutes of Health and, you know, some of the foundations. And so they're posting uh, new grant information or new funding information or who's getting funded. And so that's been interesting to follow on Twitter. I don't know, maybe it's on LinkedIn too, maybe you're just not following the right. No, Twitter, Twitter is a good place probably because that's probably where they're gonna do it. Um, not, not a lot of businesses um, <coughs> you utilize LinkedIn to entice capacity. We're lucky because we're automatically connected to so many profiles because when you Right, that you went to the University of Arizona or you graduated from there, you're automatically kind of in our system and following our page. So um, that's why it's, it's great for us. We actually have a business page too um, where we can post jobs and that sort of thing. And the thing about LinkedIn is because it's, if you're talking about your research on Twitter, you're going to want to link back to more information. So if you don't really have a website or a blog that's that can clarify kind of what you're talking about, it's kind of great if you could just put a synopsis of what you're working on on LinkedIn. Um, you just kind of have that link and kind of an article that you can go back to. The other interesting thing in LinkedIn is that the following other people's, I guess, articles or posts. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like what I used to go to Confluent of Higher Ed for, I'm finding more of that kind of content on LinkedIn now. So there's interesting articles that are put out sometimes by administrators or, you know, people who have kind of like a national scene of trends in higher ed. And so that's been very interesting to follow the kind of content that's coming out of LinkedIn that way. Yeah. Cool. All right, so kind of to wrap things up, um, kind of some, you know, and not everything's limited to these two, two platforms, of course. Um, but my recommendation is that um, before you kind of go crazy and maybe get on every social network possible, is to really build a foundation and see what works for you. Um, Maybe you are better at, you know, Twitter just works for you and you connect with people better on Twitter, you, you know, you don't want to bother with LinkedIn yet. Um, and the reason why I say this is that if you're going to try a new social network is to give it adequate time. So like if you spend one day on Twitter and are overwhelmed and you hate it, that's not really adequate time. I would say at least give it two months, you know, because you're not going to get a following overnight. And so really just give yourself time to really immerse yourself into the platform and learn how to use it and see what works best for you. Um, and with that said, um, don't be afraid to try new things. Say, you know, you start Snapchatting a daily update on what you're working on and people <laughs> follow you and they like to do that and that's what works for you. Like, just because no one else is doing that, you can be a trailblazer in that and I think that's really exciting. And so there's kind of an opportunity to do that with social media with so many new platforms come out. Um, so don't be afraid to try new things. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And that's all I have really prepared today. Is there any last questions that I can answer before I turn things over to Doug? What's your feeling on Periscope? Um. <laughs> that's still a growing. Uh, right. I feel like it's overused. And um, you, and you can follow other people on Periscope. I mean, it, it can you be can. It's it's connected to Twitter. I think it's if you have the right content for it, it can be great. I think it's often overused. Um, and if you have if you're only Periscoping for less than five minutes, then it's a great loss to you because if you want to have content that people can kind of come in and out of. Um, my friend at the at Duke University, they actually did a ten hour Periscope. Um, where they kind of had this old book, I can't think of one top of top of my head what it was, and different people were coming in and reading passages for it. And so people were kind of in and out 
out all day and they actually did really well with that periscope. But it wasn't the most exciting thing in the world, but they like tested it out and did the 10 hour periscope. Um, so it, it, different live streams can do, depends on what you're doing. If, if Twitter's kind of your, your jam, and then periscope might work for you. But there are other options. <laughs> well, it's just a really simple way to live stream an event. I mean, yeah. you know, we can set a phone right here on the top of this desk and we can be periscoping this right now. Um, but the, the problem I see with that is that there's no content control on that. So I mean, when someone starts dropping the F-bomb in the middle of the periscope, so, I mean, uh, Yeah, there, that's what you've got to be aware of. There. And as, as a university, I kind of, you know, keep the <coughs> that you use your ears. Um, are, is there copyrighted music in this? Is there, are people cursing? Um, and you same rule kind of apply if you're going to do that in official capacity. As a university representative, you want to get photo releases, make sure that you're not periscoping children. Um, so there is still kind of that thing there, but I think, you know, it's great that we have applications now. So if you can do it at personally on your Facebook, if you have a verified page, University of Arizona, we can go live on Facebook. I'm interested to see kind of how that plays out, because it sends a notification out to everybody when you go live. So you'll probably get way more viewers on there, so it's kind of interesting. All right, so. Can I ask you real quick? Yeah. So um, the other things that uh, we've been using are things like ResearchGate and Academia.edu. It seems to me like they're kind of set up in somewhat a similar format, like LinkedIn, where you have followers and you follow people. And I don't know, do you guys use those research games? And do you comment on it? Because I never put updates on there. I don't know if you have any tips on how to use that or make it the most effective. Um, I never use that, but I mean, I guess if you're going to have your niche audience updates there, um, you can kind of be as active as you can so you can kind of force those connections. Do you guys do that yeah, searches databases and upload to new articles when they're published. Mm -hmm. I mean, it waits until they're published <laughs> so that you can add things that they're accepted. But are you like active, like following people and like, getting oh, yeah. people to follow you? And... I love research. I, I look at the updates every morning because I find new articles from colleagues on research gate that probably wouldn't have gotten for six more months. <laughs> <laughs> do you do academia.edu? <coughs> Lots of opportunities. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Doug now. He's going to talk about his expertise. She won't say this about herself, but she is she is one of the foremost experts on social media that you, that you can find anywhere. I mean, when she talks about people posting uh, articles of interest <coughs> on LinkedIn. She is that person a lot of the time. And uh, so, darn near any question that you would have about social media, she can answer it. She did something like this for our communication staff several months ago, and it's still one of the most useful uh, kind of mini seminars that we ever had. So, there's, there's nothing she doesn't know about, about social media. Uh, there's a lot that I don't know. <laughs> uh, and, but uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the vehicles, uh, UA News and UA Now, which, which, uh, which I'm directly responsible for in terms of content. Uh, my background was as a reporter and editor uh, in places like Chicago, St. Louis, Miami, Florida, uh, about almost 20 years at the Arizona Republic in Phoenix. Uh, and, uh, Kind of the way we run our communications office really uh, is very similar to the way that a, a news organization runs a newsroom. We, we have <coughs> writers who are assigned to various coverage areas of the university. That makes the most sense because it's a very big place and there aren't many of us. Uh, so uh, a lot of the principles that I learned in, in the news business, I've been able to transfer and apply in uh, in what I do here. Our primary vehicles, as I said, are UA News, our website, uh, uh, it's, it's now uanews.arizona.edu, it used to be uanews.org. Uh, and that's our, that site is updated multiple times during the day with, with fresh content. Uh, we have pretty strong video presence on that, uh, on that site. Uh, and, uh, 
we're, we're constantly looking for ways to show off the, the things that are happening here at the university on our site. If you kind of look at it, and maybe some of you subscribe to it, UA Now, which is a twice a week. I like to explain it, to, to describe it as sort of a greatest hits compilation. Uh, it used to be more frequent than that. It's now, uh, it's now Tuesdays and uh, uh, Thursdays. We put it out on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, and uh, that goes to a subscriber list of about 135,000, 140,000 uh, people. That includes lawmakers, alumni, faculty, staff, and students. Anybody who signs up uh, for it can get it. So we really, we really put our, our put some extra care into trying to make sure we have stories of interest and a good mix of things, just as you would see the front page of a daily newspaper with some different kinds of stories, not all the same thing. We always are, are conscious of, okay, is this one kind of science heavy? Do we have a, do we have a humanities piece? And you know, it's, it's not an exact science. In fact, I, I I think it's hilarious that people think the media have an agenda. You know what? They are just trying to get the thing out every day, <laughs> and to some extent, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to we're trying to put content on our site <laughs> that's compelling and interesting. We don't have this big, you know, grand view of uh, of the world that people sometimes ascribe to us. So, so that that's kind of the internal side of, of what our office does. The external side is uh, is active. Uh, uh, promotion of the university to media outlets. Okay, uh, uh, we pitch stories that happen uh, here on campus uh, to major news outlets. We, within the past week, we we developed an experts list and some content around the Zika virus because that's uh, that's a, a, a pretty hot story right now. So there there are kind of two dimensions to what our office does: this internal side where we're developing content for our own site and this external site where we're fielding, fielding inquiries from media. Hey, do you have somebody who can talk about uh, the, the primary election system in the United States? These kinds of calls come, they, they, they come in daily and there's no predicting them and that's what makes it fun because it, it, it's, it, it's different stuff every day, no two, no two days are the same. So, so there are a lot of similarities as you're seeing with with the uh, with the, the news business, there's a, there's another dimension, kind of a third and maybe a, a little bit lesser dimension, where we provide some assistance on campus. Uh, uh, say a, a dean wants to wants to craft an op-ed uh, piece for for the for the local paper or for the Republic in Phoenix. We'll sometimes help with that uh, and 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 shape some of the thought around around that. So. It's kind of this, kind of an advisory, almost an advisory role. Uh, that's that's a that's a, a lesser role, not as not as significant as the internal and external uh, things that we do. People are ask people ask me all the time because I've been in a, the news business a long time. What do the media want? <laughs> and. Uh, I think that can be, I, I'm, I'm a bullet point guy in a bullet point world, and I think that can be summed up in, in pretty, pretty easily. First of all, they want accessibility. They want to be able to get at uh, a source. They want to know that when they're calling or emailing somebody, somebody's going to respond. Okay? And, and in, in kind of in, in tandem with that, they want it to be timely. These are people who are often working on a deadline. and. Uh, it's not like it's not like uh, they have a week or ten days for you to get back. Sometimes they do, but most of the time they want somebody today or tomorrow. Uh, that presents some some challenges at times. They want information or perspective. Okay, that's that's an, a lot of the time they're operating with a little bit of information. What they really want is perspective on the information that they do have. Okay, so that's, a, that's an important thing to, to understand. And, and last but not least, sometimes they just want to keep an editor off their back. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was a reporter long enough, and I was an editor long enough, to know that, that, that sometimes, 
like I said, you're trying to get the thing out. You are just trying to keep your boss out of your hair and get a story. Okay, and it, it's no more complicated than that. So there are a lot of things at, at, at work. Uh, they they don't have this. For the most part, they do not have this uh, gotcha mentality. That that's that's sort of a, a, an easy characterization, I think, in our country that they're that they that they're, they they've got some some agenda. They're they're determined to catch you making a mistake. Most of the time, that is not the case. Not all of the time, but most of the time, they're just try mostly trying for information and perspective, and they want access to it, and they want a response to it uh, uh, as, 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 as quickly as they can get it. I thought also it'd be interesting to, to, maybe, to maybe talk about well, what, what makes for a good story. What are the kinds of stories that they are that they are looking for, and and, and maybe maybe some examples of those that, that are from our from the news now or from our campus. Uh, and, I, and I came up with sort of a sort of loosely five categories for that. Uh, one would be that it's unique, that it's one of a kind. If it's not unique, the definition of which is one of a kind, it's at least unusual. Okay, uh, one that would fit that uh, description would be uh, driverless cars that Uber is developing uh, in conjunction with our College of Optical Sciences. That is unusual. Okay, that's that's uh, th that would fit uh, that description. Another another aspect of a good story would be that it, it, it has an <coughs> audience already or potentially could have one. Okay, here's a good example. Uh, not too long ago, one of our writers, Monica Everett, did a piece uh, with a professor here who talked about bulk buying. Uh, she's, in, she's in this college, as a matter of fact, or in, in this school. And, uh, and how that's actually a bad idea. It's more economical for you to go to the store you know, more frequently because when you bulk buy, you end up wasting most of what you got to deal on. And then that's not a deal at all. So that story got huge pickup. Why? Well, there's an audience for that. There, everybody goes shopping. Everybody buys groceries. Uh, that story went all over the country uh, because it was it, it, it went sort of it was kind of counterintuitive. What do you mean bulk buying doesn't save you money? Well, because you're throwing most of it out because it's bad. Okay, at, at the end of a week or. Ten days. So that's an example of a story that had had, had an audience that was was kind of ready made for for that story. Another one is timeliness. Another another function of, of a, uh, a, a, a aspect of a good story would be timeliness. The Zika virus. <coughs> Last week, maybe ten days ago, that that was really really hot. It's still big. It's still it's kind of it's kind of hit a plateau right now. But that's an example of something that's really timely, particularly with the aspect relative to birth, birth defects. Okay, there's a lot of talk around, around that right now. We put something out with our experts uh, uh, hoping that, that in that discussion, our people would, would be able to, to uh, weigh in on that. Another aspect of a good story is that it's significant. Water on Mars. Okay, very significant, huge story. That was our, that was a U of A story late uh, last year in, in the fall. The Sierra Nevada no, snowpack was at a 500 year uh, uh, low. That was a U of A story. That was about the same time last fall. Those are stories that are significant. Okay, those are, those can have kind of the, this weight and this impact that maybe other stories might not have. And a last category, and this is vastly underrated with, with, uh, with most people, is kind of a human interest or a quirky story. Uh, I'll give you a couple of good examples of that. Uh, one would be the hummingbirds that took up residence at ENR2. That went huge. Once we had video of that, she was putting it out. We were putting it out. It was, a, and there are people 
to this day all over the country who know that building because of the hummingbird nest and the camera that was trained on it for a period of about two weeks. So that's a that's kind of a quirky human interest story. When those when those those come along, they are a lot of fun to get behind. Uh, another example uh, uh, about uh, I think it was about commencement time last year. We had a story about a uh, Nigerian-born woman who was a double major in Africana studies and vet science. Now that's kind of an unusual humanities STEM. <coughs> Uh, uh, pairing in a student, we thought that was pretty that, that, that was pretty interesting, and and that got some got some pickup just because it there was human interest. It was it was a little bit unusual. So you see, there's some there's some overlap here in these in these categories, of, of course. But those are kind of uh, things that make uh, that how news people decide what is a good story. It's unusual or unique. It has an audience, it's timely, it's significant, and, and maybe there's a human interest or kind of, a, kind of a, an offbeat aspect uh, uh, to it. So those are some of the things that, that, that news people sort of look for, consciously or subconsciously. I think the longer you're in the news business, you just sort of have this kind of radar that, that goes off, this alarm that goes off when, when a story hits one or more of those aspects. So anyway, that's a little bit about, uh, about what we do, what, what media are looking for, and what, what might, might qualify as a good story. Uh, people always want to know, well, uh, how do you handle media interviews? Uh, and you know, I never really thought about that when I was a reporter. That, that somebody might be thinking on the other end, how do I handle this guy? I just saw it as a conversation. And I would encourage you, if you're ever in that spot, to see it the same way, uh, and to not attach, you know, uh, uh, apocalyptic uh, uh, aspects to uh, to talking to somebody on the telephone, because that's really what it, it comes down to: is talking to somebody on the phone or emailing with them. Uh, about something that's of mutual interest. Their interest is probably a little, probably a little on the temporary side. Yours is a little on the permanent side. But that doesn't mean there can't be some common ground. I think in uh, in what you talk about. Question? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, sure. I heard you say that media doesn't have an agenda, and I just am thinking about about Fox News Network or. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about sometimes some things that I feel like are missing from UA News. Okay. Um, sure. And so things that are that are timely, mm -hmm. like you mentioned the Zika virus. And, mm -hmm. But what I'm thinking is more timely is things happening on campus, like suicides, <coughs> rapes. We just had a suicide in Coffler Building a few weeks ago. There wasn't a lot of news about it. Um, in fact, a woman was raped in the Coffler Building in October, and I'm just wondering why we aren't having those conversations. And so, so why isn't that news? And, and especially in academia, we want to we want to figure out, you know, why this is happening. We want numbers, and we want to make change. I'm just wondering why those things. I mean, who says what you can or cannot produce? In, in that per in that particular case, I think we would probably be more likely to report on what's being done uh -huh. on campus in those areas rather than to report red, red, there's kind of a an assumption on our part that the day-to-day -day crime news is going to be covered by the local by the local folks right. and to some extent so. yeah. the, the, the wildcat the, the wildcat is good. Yeah. Well, we treat we treat the wildcat as another local media outlet we don't we don't treat them as a student paper we treat them as a legitimate news organization so I think it's more likely in that case that we would that we would report on measures that that uh, that the university was taking to ensure campus safety or it's more big picture type of things. Right, not not even much safety, but prevention, intervention, yeah, exactly. mental health. Exactly. Uh, you know. There's a there's a good that's a really good question. Uh, there's a good example. Every every uh, 
every fall, the university is required by law to issue the uh, what, what's called the Clary Report. Okay, and that is a report of uh, sexual assaults on our on our campus. All universities are required to issue that report every year. Uh, and uh, I think I don't know if it was last year or the year before. Uh, assaults were up slightly. Well. Uh, there are plenty of people in, in, you know, higher education who would be running around, wringing their hands and saying, "Oh my gosh, what do we do? What do we do?" Well, we saw that as an opportunity to say, "Okay, they're up slightly, but so are the, so are the ways of reporting. The ways of reporting are so much better now. Uh, there are at least a half dozen organizations on campus." that report now that never did before. So naturally with those channels available, you're, we're probably going to, we're going to see that. That actually turned out, and, and I know I can hear news guys that I used to work with, that's really nice spin, Carol, thanks. Well, <laughs> it's both. It's spin and it's also the truth that, that those numbers are up because people are more comfortable, women are more comfortable coming forward in those situations. So I, that's kind of a long way of answering your question. I do think that that we will that that when there's a trend or when there when the university is addressing something in sort of a bit more universal way, mm -hmm. that we would probably we would probably be on that. Uh, but the day to day not not so much. So, so who decides if it's timely? I mean Zika is, is timely but I think that I think that things like rape and mental illness or suicide are affecting mm -hmm. those of us on campus more than the Zika everyone at this point, sure. so why aren't we talking about those things? Sure. I guess I'm wondering if, the, if there's some sort of censorship or you have to follow some sort of, like we don't talk about day-to-day -day stuff, well how come? You know? Uh, there's, really not, there, there's, there's really not, uh, uh, we, we, I will say that we know who we, know who we work for. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> we're, we, we, we are not going. We're not going to. We're not going to air university right. do, dirty laundry. That's what that, I'm thinking. You know, <laughs> if we don't have to. So, yeah. uh, and uh, there are going to. There are plenty of organizations that'll do that for us. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that, that's that's probably the best explanation I can give for that. Do we? Do we? Weigh every single story and and steer completely clear of things that are that are controversial. No, but I think there are also ways as a professional of handling those that can be that can be respectful of the issue and also be respectful of the institution's position. And that's a little bit of a that's at times that can be a little bit of a tap dance. But uh, that's what you know. We're here we're, we're here to do that. And, 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 and to make it still make sense, even though we work for the university. Okay. So I think, you know, part of what this conversation is too, is, is the whole reason why we're doing this training today, is because, you know, we also have to respond <coughs> when we get calls, and we have to be prepared to provide comments that maybe we think are missing in the media so far. Um, and we have to be able to provide those comments in a way that is clear and consistent and, you know, cannot, you know, when we always talk about in terms of our writing, like, you know, a, a mark of good writing is that, you know, the reader is not misunderstanding it. So you have to also, you know, when you're having those, conver I mean, conversation is a nice way to put it so that we can be at ease, but we also have to be, you know, very focused. Uh, what I had heard is, you know, people had, talk, had uh, told me to, create my own talking points mm -hmm. and have like maybe no more than three talking points and they said no matter what they ask you come back to those talking points yeah. <laughs> because sometimes like you said they are trying to do stories really quick and they don't always you know have the time to examine it or they may ask a question you know from a different perspective and rather than being caught off guard or trying to answer the question that they ask to stay on point with what my expertise is or you know what perspective I want to add to that story um, and, and it is about picking up the phone when they when you are responding to the email when you get the ask being prepared to give your comment um, 
we're sending out press releases uh, about um, what you would like to see in the news too, and also I think addressing it. Off we've sent out, you know, for different events, press releases, and th some things get picked up and some things don't. Right. And I think right. sometimes the ones that don't, it's like we wrote it in this very academic, <laughs> you know, very what to us was very interesting, but to the media it didn't hit those five points. You right. know, for one reason or another, but we weren't. So you know, I think sometimes doing the press releases or responding to the media, uh, you do have to keep in mind your audience, and you know, <coughs> making sure that your message is appropriate. Versus yeah, that's a, for like your academic audience. Right. That's a good transition to what I, I have kind of a, a few quick and dirty uh, tips on how to do, how to kind of navigate this that are really simple and easily understood and, and, and she had a couple of those. Number one, I think, is to respond as promptly as you can. Uh, I, I, it doesn't mean that you have to talk on the issue right away, uh, but, to, but news, news people really appreciate if you call them back and say, hey, uh, I can talk to you just not right now, uh, in an hour or later today. Or when is your deadline? Would that work for you? I, I guarantee you, those people, even if you know they didn't have anything I could use much, I appreciated that courtesy and knowing that somebody got my call, they're working on it. They may have, I don't know how much, whether they can tell me anything or not, but they're going to, they're, they're, I, I matter to them in some way. So that's really that's really important. You can ask your own questions, and should. Uh, you want to know as best as you can what the story is about. Uh, what, you know, what are what are you going to be? What, what, you know, what, what are you writing a story about? And, and in while you're asking those questions, to determine are you the best person to talk about that? There might be somebody in your department or or in the cubicle next to you that is actually a better authority on that than you are and someone that they that, that really is, is the person they should be talking to. Most of the time, uh, as you were just saying, they're not wanting to drill down to this to this incredibly uh, sophisticated level of understanding. Most of the time, <laughs> and if they're on deadline, they're going to take anybody that, that, that's got words coming out of their mouth. <laughs> so, so it's not... It, it, it's usually a generalist perspective that they're after, but sometimes there's someone right next to you that could really be that, that could really help the, help them even better. So that's something to that's something to kind of weigh in your mind. Are you the best person to be to be talking about it? Is there someone is there someone that's even better? Uh, you, I just kind of kind of kind of mentioned this. Buy yourself a little bit of time. You might have just come from an incredibly stressful traffic jam, <laughs> and you got back to your office, and the phone rang, and it's a reporter, and they want, and they're on deadline, and they and they they want you to comment on something. Good idea, to maybe call a timeout and say, "Hey, look, uh, this isn't a good time, but I can call you back in a half hour, or I can call you back in an hour. Maybe some time." To collect your thoughts and, th and, and, like I said, in the process, ask you know what what are you looking what are you looking for from me? Uh, how can I help you? And, and then 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 you then you're able to have a have a conversation at a at a at a better time uh, for you. Generally, generally putting off a reporter, they don't mind that. Forgetting about them, that's the stuff that they that's the stuff that they get a little bit a little bit irritated. Uh, so, I mean, in what I do, I get a lot of calls from reporters, and it, there is, it, there are many times, I'm sure they're thinking, hey, that, if that guy Carol tells me he doesn't know one more time, I'm going to stop calling him. Well, if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know, but I'm also going to tell you I'm going to try to find somebody who does. Okay, I'm going to try to help you with somebody who does know. Okay, uh, make some, and, and Andrea said this, uh, Make some no notes about the things you want to cover. Uh, you know, when I was a reporter, I went into interviews with a few with a few notes of what I wanted to ask. You should apply the same thing when you're being <coughs> interviewed. Make a few notes about things you want to talk about. Have some talking points. Have a main point that you can return to. 
Okay, some of the time you would be surprised at how often somebody has been given a story. Give us a story on Zika. Well, that's like give us a story on North America. Uh, you know, can you pin, can you narrow it down a little bit? You may have an opportunity to narrow it down for them. Okay, with the with the point with with the point that you make. If you make a point consistently and have you know have a nice way of following it up, uh, you know, uh, uh, and explaining yourself, a lot of times that'll end up being the story. Uh, especially with an experienced reporter that's kind of fumbling around and not really sure. Oh man, I, I, I just know I got to come up with a Zika story by five o'clock. I have no idea what I'm going to write about. Well, you can you can kind of steer that maybe a little bit. Don't underestimate it, but have a main point when you're asked about it. If for any reason something makes you feel weird or, or oh man, this seems like a time bomb and I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I, you can always call us. You can always call us and say, you know, I just got an interview request that's really, really weird and oddball. And it, it seems like it, it, it could be trouble. It, I'm not really sure. We're happy to help. Uh, that, that's, that's never an issue with our office. It happens from time to time. We'll get things bounced to us. Hey, you guys, want, can you guys call this, this, this reporter? I'm not really sure what they're after. Uh, you know, most reporters are, some reporters will go through our office. More often, the more aggressive ones, of which I was, uh, will go, will call, call directly. They, all of our phone numbers are published. And the, the, you know, most reporters were, are operating like, hey, I need to get a story. I'm going to, I think this is the best source. I'm calling them up. Okay, so, so either way, it, is, it, it can work, but just know that, 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 that there's, there's kind of two levels of operating out there. There's people that will come through our office and say, hey, can you find me an expert on such and such? Or this, this hap happens, it surprises me. <laughs> is it okay for me to talk with so-and-so? Well, if you're going to ask me, I'll check with so-and-so and make sure it's okay. <coughs> if I had my reporter hat on, you wouldn't even be talking to me. You would, you would be calling. So, they, calls come out of the blue. It, it's, it happens. It <coughs> is public information. They can, they, can find a, they can find a phone number. Beware of taking any, of talking off the record. Okay? Any time, even if a reporter says, hey, just off the record, can you tell me about this? There are plenty of reporters for whom nothing is off the record, even when they say it will be. So don't trust off the record. That is right up there with the swap plan in Florida kind of, kind of thing. Uh, if you've given an interview and, and, and media have reached out to you on any subject, Maybe a good idea to let the communications person know in your college or in your department, hey, uh, I talked to, just to kind of keep people in the loop on this. That's, that's, never, a, that's never a bad idea, uh, not necessarily with the idea of guidance, but people then like to look for it. You know, I, I would usually ask a reporter at the end, hey, have any idea when this is going to run or, or uh, you know, when you, when you do the story, can you send me a link? Or you know, that's we kind of measure ourselves that way uh, with placements that we get. Uh, so so it's never it, it, it's never out of line to ask a, a reporter, hey, what you know, can you you know, can you give me some idea of when you're when you're gonna when it's gonna publish? Particularly if it's not a deadline, if it's a deadline story, you know that the answer is usually tomorrow. Uh, but it could be could be something that they're gonna next week, next two weeks something like that. Right there with off the record is to avoid saying no comment. That really raises red flags about, oh, well, there must be something fishy about this. Uh, that, <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of an out that's not really an out. And it, uh, it, it really raises more uh, concern than it, than, it, than it probably should. If you're not prepared to comment, then you say, you know, I really, you know, I, I need to get back to you on that. I'm not really, uh, uh, I'm not really, you know, the, the best informed that I could be on that right now. There are ways to, 
to, to, to say the same thing without saying those two words. Because those two words to a reporter are that, that they will often prompt the feeding frenzy, and, un, and unnecessarily so. Uh, they, they, they will interpret that, oh, well, there's more digging to be done here. Well, you no, know, you, the truth is that you really don't have enough information to comment. That's really what you need to be saying rather than no comment. So those are just some of the things that, that, uh, uh, that, I, that I would recommend. I, I really I would emphasize to see it as a conversation when at all possible, as an exchange, not as, a, as an adversarial uh, sort of, it's usually not adversarial unless somebody makes it that way. Uh, so it's usually, it, 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 it usually does fall in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the category of conversation. And to be, and to be, to be sh make short points and to have a main point. I think those are, are two things that you can never really go, go wrong with. Uh, when you're dealing with uh, with media, they they really most of the reporters I have known in a lengthy career care about doing a really good job. Uh, they they're under a lot of pressure. Sometimes that makes them appear a little demanding and ridiculous and crazy but they really are concerned mostly about doing a good job. There's a lot of pride involved in, in being a good reporter, in being a good editor. Uh, and I think that if, if you think that, if you think about it that way, you think, man, they're just trying to do their job, uh, uh, their job well. And sometimes that leads to short conversations and things that can get kind of misinterpreted. It, 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 then, I think you, then I think you understand. If you're able to put yourself in their shoes a little bit, I think you, you'll do better uh, in, in your uh, interactions with, with media folks. So. It's, it's pretty much common sense, <coughs> but a lot of the time, the pressures that you're under or the other person is under can kind of twist things a little bit. But it really is an exchange, a conversation, an interaction. Most of the time, it goes very, very well. Some of the time, it goes less well. And very little of the time does it go just horrible. And that's what I would most want you to take away. So, and thanks for the free ads for UA News. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I haven't seen I mean, if you do have story ideas, by all means, you can let you can send them to me. There are people that do that. I love them. There is no such thing as too much stuff. Uh, see, our office, I probably got there's an office of people back there who would be like, "Whoa, wait, 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 wait man, what are you saying?" No, it's that there's no such thing as too much information. No such thing. Do you have any advice for faculty for writing op eds? So like. A week ago today, I did research on transgender youth. There was a trans young person who has autism that was shot by police and killed in the USA area. Right. And so I've been like struggling with a week, like, I need to do something. This is what mm -hmm. I can research on. How do I how do I go about writing an op ed in a in a effective way? That's a good question. I think the best way you could do that is to uh, First of all, try to think short. Think, uh, think anywhere between uh, 500 and 800 words. Uh, they're generally anything over. There, it may be, it may be a literary classic. They'll say too long, too long, and, then, and it gets dismissed out of hand, just, just immediately. And think about, really think about, okay, what are, as I just said about in, in dealing with a reporter. What are two or three key points that you want to make? Uh, you know, in the wake of something like that, it's not going to be news anymore. But so, so the fact that it happened—that's the, the shelf life of the event itself is already passed. What are you going to say that is sort of an enduring kind of a point? 
what are you going to say that's kind of something that that's a truism about what happened that that will stick with people? But that's I think where you want it. You want to you want to have not a lot of those points, but a couple or three points that you work in and back up in, into into the piece, and then and then there's a last piece. I would show it to somebody that that knows your writing and that knows you, and and said and where you can say, hey, take a look at this. Does this make sense to you? Before you go anywhere with it, to have at least one, and, and if 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 possible, a second, an additional person to take a look at. Because if, generally speaking, if it hangs together for somebody who's coming to the fold, then it'll hang together in, in print. And those are things that, you know, through FMI, we can support faculty with doing. And I know um, Kim and Robert have been able to help with some of those things in the past, too, or sending them out to the media. So once you have it written, then, you know, getting it out to all the right people so that hopefully it will get picked mm -hmm. up. Not only here locally, but if it's a bigger issue um, or something with you know national relevance, they'll get picked up by other sources too. Um, I have a question that's kind of an intersection of both of your uh, areas, which is, do you have an opinion, um, really, about uh, the best sort of online presence for being contacted by news organizations, whether that's local or national? I was thinking about, like, I do know some people who have their own websites, even though you know they, it's not like they have anything on there aside from about themselves, or is it, and do you find that it's people who have a, they're easier to find online, that those of these folks, news organizations are finding? Um, generally, I think if, if somebody's kind of looking, and they, they'll, they'll try to contact you. Um, I've been contacted to comment on things before through like Twitter. I think that's a popular one. Oh. A lot of reporters are on Twitter. Um, find you there. That's probably the social network that they would contact you in. Otherwise, if you can find your information like, on the website, they might call you or before. But it, well, now more than ever, it's really easy to send like, a direct message to somebody or tweet them like, hey, I'm from such and such magazine. Um, do you to come here for me? Um, connect on that. So um, Twitter's probably a good place that reporters might contact you that way. I've we a lot through websites. People find me through websites. Like what? Just sort of through websites? through like the UA website. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where where I am there, and they, they must put in like the search words, and then okay, it pops gotcha. up through those profiles. Yeah. That are on there. Okay. But then you know, once you get like once certain news outlets have you on their expert interview <laughs> list, mm -hmm. you know, or certain reporters know you, then they often you know will call you again in the future um, if it's a similar topic, and whether to interview you or for you to recommend who they can. I'll tell you what's really gold to along what you're what you're saying there. What's really gold to a reporter is if you can help them, then you can say, you know, but we've got something coming in in another month that you might be interested in. They, I guarantee you, they'll file that away, and they'll they'll remember that. So if you can if you can think of those exchanges as an opportunity to share some information about maybe some something else that you're working on or that a colleague is working on. Now they feel like they're on the inside. Now they feel like they have some information that, yeah, okay, man, I didn't get it for, I didn't get what I needed for this particular story, but there, there'll be some payoff for me in another way on, on down the line. That's that's really value-added stuff for a reporter, I think. I always, and those people, you're only human. You could, you end up going back to those people more often than you probably should because they just know what's going on. They are great, those are great sources. And that's, that's how you can, uh, from our side, you can cultivate being a good source. Now I can't help you with that one, but I can, I can tell you that in two weeks we're gonna have this. And I think that just, that just makes, the, makes the relationship but these are just relationships, really. I was going to say, from our side, too, I think that's are. actually building that relationship with, especially the editors, right? The reporters are good, too, but especially the editors, because they're the ones fielding all the different stories. So that, again, they, maybe they don't pick up one story, but then you have another one that comes out, you know, or you, you know, you need something else, you can go back to them. Um, and, and they know, too, I mean, people remember, too, like, if a story hits, like, oh, yeah, like, people responded to that, or there are more comments, or that was a solid interview, you know, and so 
so they know that that's a good place to get them. And we had, uh, there's a, got the, one of the assigning editors at Channel 4, uh, and they're, they're, they're a pretty aggressive outfit in this town uh, uh, in, in terms of the way they approach news. He has come to rely on us so often that he, came, he wanted to come down to our office and meet us. And I thought, are you sure you don't have anything better to do? <laughs> I mean, like, we're nothing special. He's like, well, you know, I, I just wanted to come down and see you guys. I'm like, well, I'm not going to miss that opportunity when he's down to, to talk to him about stuff. So that's what we're kind of talking about. When they know that they can that they can count on you being prompt and reliable, and when they're when they're needing information, they're getting called back. That will that will pay off. That would once in a while you're going to have to take a hit. Yeah. That's part of life. Once in a while, you're, they're going to report on something that you're kind of going, oh man, I wish they hadn't have done that. Uh, that is infrequent enough that, that it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's really not, not really worth worrying about. The, the, the good stories that we get that illuminate the things that are happening here uh, far, far outweigh uh, the hit pieces or the things that, that we might say, well, that's not that big of a story. They blew that way up beyond what it's really worth. You just, you know, the, the good thing, the good thing about the news cycle, people are on to the next thing 24 hours later. Even the bad stuff doesn't <laughs> stick for very long. It well, just and it's doesn't. good for us to to know about UVA News and UVA Now because then a lot of times their headline stories do get picked up by other national outlets. So it is one way for us to funnel, you know, or get attention from all our stuff because we're not out there cultivating relationships with Wall Street Journal every day or, you know, NPR every day. But these guys do have that and they're looking to them. So it is one way to you know, get our stuff to have more attention. There is no question that people watch this university. There is, because our stories will get picked up on Google Stories that we post to our site uh, get picked up on Google Alerts. People watch what's coming out of this university. It's a it's a it's a tier one research research institution, uh, one of seventy that that in the in the country that fit that description. That people know, and, and this is going to be a really really good year for us because the asteroid sample return mission is the last quarter of the year. And every major news organization around the world will be on that story. So we can't hardly wait until September for the launch. Now, then everybody's going to go, hey, what's happening? Then they'll be going, well, why is it taking so long? Well, it's kind of a long way. Uh, you know, but. But around the launch, there will be a lot of interest. And we are already planning ways that we can tell our story, not just about that mission, but about the fact that we are a full-on space sciences giant. That's an opportunity for us out internally to say, OK, we've got this mission, and there's going to be a lot of attention. But can't we also show them that this is, a, this is no flash in the pan for us. We're known for this. That's why, that's why we're doing it. We're known for this. There are other things, that's just one example, there are other things that we're well known for too. And when we have a chance to, to, to tell those stories you know, around something that media are already interested in, that's where we want to be. Well, we really we appreciate want. your time today. Thank you so much. Um, I hope this was uh, get, gets everybody thinking a little bit more about how we can make sure that UVA is not only known just for science about space, but also science about humans. <laughs> thank, you so much. So, thank you very much. And I, I have some of my cards here if you want to pick up one. If you want